Welcome, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Before the hush fell, the buzz in here was just quite extraordinary. Um, so I, for one, am absolutely thrilled to be introducing this afternoon. I'm going to keep it incredibly short because I know there's one particular person that you've all come to listen to. This event is part of a celebration of the reopening of the Museum of Zoology uh, just around the corner within this David Attenborough building which is dedicated to conserving biodiversity for future generations. We really look forward to um, you all visiting the museum, seeing the new displays, becoming truly excited by the diversity of the animal kingdom. It gives me incredible pleasure to introduce Liz Bonin to you this afternoon. She's going to be the host for the conversation over the next three quarters of an hour or so. Liz, we are thrilled that she accepted our invitation to host this afternoon. She's a wildlife and science presenter, and I know that she has a particular interest in big cats, and she actually loves tigers, and she did her master's research on tigers. But Liz is also passionate about encouraging awareness of environmental issues. And at the moment, she's taken up Sir David's baton in relation to plastic and all the problems with plastics. And she's encouraging awareness, but also at the same time, helping us to understand the ways in which scientists of all hues are trying to alleviate environmental problems. So without further ado, I shall introduce uh, invite Liz to join us on the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. That was such a lovely introduction. I'm kind of blushing. Thank you so much. I've had such a lovely afternoon here so far, and now it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Babbage Lecture Theatre for a very special conversation with Sir David Attenborough in celebration of the reopening of the magnificent Cambridge Museum of Zoology. Uh, it's an endeavour that took five years to complete and has resulted in this uh, wondrous space that houses over two million specimens uh, that have been collected over the past 200 years or so. Um, I'm especially excited about today because members of the public are going to get to ask their own questions to Sir David. And uh, they can ask questions about conservation, his life, his career, the museum, and everything in between. And um, asking those questions today are members of the museum's two zoology clubs. So these are made up of wildlife enthusiasts aged between six years old and 18 years old. And they get to flex their, their passion for natural history with the support of newsletters and workshops and, and events that are held by the museum. We've also got questions from our wonderful museum volunteers who have been uh, so integral to the very uh, smooth runnings of the organization uh, of all the specimens as the museum was being remodeled and are also such an important part of the museum as they impart their knowledge and uh, their enthusiasm to all the visitors who come here. And finally, we also have questions from members of the public who wrote in to the museum online and uh, about, we had about almost 200 questions. So a big welcome to all of you who got picked. I'll be asking those questions um, for you. So welcome to all of those lovely people and to all of you uh, this evening. Um, I'm very excited about this. It's now uh, my pleasure to ask you to welcome uh, our honoured guest uh, this evening, the inimitable Sir David Attenborough. David, I know that Paul mentioned we have about three quarters of an hour, but I suspect you'd all like me to maybe overrun a little bit. Let's see how we go. <laughs> uh, can I begin by asking you and, you, and you put it so beautifully at the official opening uh, just a while back, what you make of the new remodeled museum and how it can contribute to inspiring a whole new generation of wildlife enthusiasts and advocates? Um, well, 
It has an atmosphere which is quite unlike any other museum of zoology or natural history that I know. Now, that's not their fault, as it were, <laughs> um, because they've been founded for a very long time. Uh, and there are great museums, and there's a marvelous thing to, to be a very uh, uh, a museum with a long history in natural history, because of course historic specimens are type specimens are the, the most important objects that a museum of this kind can have. Um, but that does mean that they they have a presentation which dates for some decades back. This museum uh, actually has the advantage of being all those inheritance of ancient things. I mean, there are Darwin specimens here, for heaven's sake. There are Wallace's specimens. They're a fantastic collection. And you, now you've got a new, glittering, beautifully designed museum with all the latest science, scientific information and inspiration so that it's presented in, in a way which makes it a grand, wonderful, coherent, story over the last 3,000 million years that life has been on this planet. And it's all wherever it is. It's, it's either up there. Or... I've lost my bearings. <laughs> but it's somewhere here. <laughs> and it's glittering and beautiful and tomorrow. It's a wonderful place. It really is. I know some of you have already seen it, some of you haven't, but if you're about to see it after this, you're in for a real, real treat. Um, David, have you seen the role of museums evolve over the years? And, and if so, what do you think personally should the roles of museums be today? Um, well, of course, point number one, great zoological museums hold type specimens. Those are the specimens, and there are many scientists here who will know this, but uh, for those who don't, um, if you want to establish a species, you have to describe it in words and drawings if you can, but you also have to, got, if you think you've discovered it, you also then have to deposit it uh, in a, uh, uh, an institution like this one, which is a recognized scientific institution. In, and if that is adopted and they said, yes, this is the first specimen of that thing that, and that has your name attached to it, that then becomes the time specimen. And anybody in the world who wants to know what hit the specimen they found, is whether it's this or whether it's something else, has to come here to see it. Uh, now, these days, what with uh, genomics and one thing and another, that is going to change, I dare say, a bit. But nonetheless, in the end, the type specimens are the most precious thing that a scientific museum like this can have. So the specimen, type specimens, that's the first thing. But the second thing is the objects themselves. You can go to all sorts of places um, and learn all sorts of things about the natural world, but the basic thing is the shell, the feathers, the skin, the bones, the real thing. I remember going as a boy to the Natural History Museum and I was so excited because I was going to see a dinosaur skeleton, you know. And uh, it, I turned up in South Kensington, and this is no secret, and I'm not letting down, not <laughs> um, uh, in any way criticizing the Natural History Museum in South Kensington, but there was this huge, great Diplodocus. And I went in 88, I thought, look, it's a dinosaur. And I looked at the label, and it said, replica. I thought, <laughs> <"Hun."> <laughs> I'm not interested in replicas. I thought I was going to see a real dinosaur. Well, it, it, I mean, it was a replica because it was, it was discovered in America. And, and Carnegie, a Scotsman, a benefactor, a multimillionaire, arranged for those specimens to go around the world. They were one in France and Berlin and, and London. Um, and in many ways, of course, skeletons, particularly big vertebrate skeletons, are so heavy. Uh, that you can't mount them. I mean, it's, it's too big a load to carry. So that a lot of dinosaur skeletons are, are, are made out of lightweight fiberglass or, or plaster in the old days. But this museum has got real skeletons in it. I don't know how many replicas there are. There may be some, but there are also real ones. And real objects, real butterflies, you know, fantastic things, 
as a child to go into the museum. I remember the Natural History Museum, to give it credit, did have a huge thing, not as big as that, but maybe about a quarter as big as that, and it was just filled with different species of butterfly. And I, my jaw sagged as a boy, I thought, how come there are all these marvellous colours and marvellous shapes and swallowtails and some with transparent wings? How um, That knocked me out. Now, I won't pretend that I haven't forgotten what your question was, but... <laughs> <laughs> The, the importance of museums, I mean, you've painted it, that's exactly what it's about, it's about getting up close. But, but as, w as the world changes, David, and as Paul um, puts so well exactly in his so. speech, the, the roles of museums are beginning to change in a way that embraces the importance of our understanding yes. of biodiversity and yes. conservation. Yes, and so but what I was saying is that, or attempting to say was that, please, museums are places for the real thing. Mm. And there's nowhere else in, in our communities are in that kind of way. But these days, museums of natural history also have a huge responsibility, uh, which is to explain what is happening to the natural world. How the natural world came into existence is very important in the first place. But what its future is, uh, in particularly what the responsibility we have for its future, that is also extremely important for all museums, natural history museums, to explain. And this museum does it marvellously. Yes. Uh, and the way it mixes uh, the, the fossils, which could tell you how these present uh, groups of animals came into existence, and then you see the animals themselves. Breathtaking, wonderful day. Absolutely, undoubtedly. Um, I've got a question for you now from uh, Rebecca Richmond-Smith, who won a place in the audience uh, when she wrote in online with her question. And she's studying zoology here in Cambridge, as it happens. She's a big fan of yours, and she wants to know, do you remember the first time a museum exhibit impacted the way you think or act? And if so, what was it, and how did it impact you? Well, I've already said uh, that, that screen of, of butterflies with, with perhaps uh, 300, 400 different species on it. But there was, I, I mean, as it so happens, there was, there was Natural History Museum that day when I went. I did see another thing that made a huge impression on me. And that was uh, the, skin, the skeleton of a ground sloth, the South American ground sloth. Mylodon, which is like a... Um, what a bigger, it's bigger than a cow. I mean, it's, it's a huge, great animal that munched uh, vegetation in South America. Uh, but what made this as extraordinary was not only was this great thing rearing up, but on the f in front of it, there was a piece of skin covered with some other coarse brown hair and some turds, some droppings. <laughs> and I looked at this and it said, that these, this skin and these droppings have been found in a cave in South America. Yeah. Um, and uh, was this animal still alive or was it not? Um, and the conclusion, as far as I remember the label, was that it was not. But nonetheless, you asked me what impact it made on me. Nonetheless, 35 years later, <laughs> I found myself in South America. <laughs> and I remember that uh, skeleton, and I remember, of course, I read it up too. Uh, I, it was, they'd been found in a cave in a, in, right in the south of Patagonia called uh, Rancho uh, Ultima Esperanza, the last hope uh, ranch. Wow. And we got a Land Rover, and we drove, I don't know, almost 150 miles, <laughs> and, and found this cave. Did you find any more skin? What or do you think? Feces? Why do you think I went? Yeah, <laughs> Were you frantically uh, scurrying around uh, in the cave? But uh, the one part of the thing about it, about it was the discoverer, uh, 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 an American Argentinian uh, paleontologist called Amagino, he described how uh, in the cave there was the remnants of a wall. And was it the case, says he, that early man came across this? Great giant sloths, which were so remained, uh, remains were so fresh in that very, very cold atmosphere, 
and maybe this was a wall in which they had kept these things, like great cows. Well, actually, when you get to the cave, you can see perfectly well that this line of that might have been a rudimentary wall was actually a rock fall from the ceiling. <laughs> so, uh, 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 big disappointment. But nonetheless, we went. And so, this is, this, you just asked me what made an impression on me. That was what made an that impression is, on me. That is some and, impression. And that's what I did. I love it. Um, collections have always made an impression on you, ever since you were a very young child in Leicester, cycling around frantically collecting eggs and fossils. How much do you think that period of, of your life as a young boy um, influenced your, your career decisions, your career path? Well, um, it's customary for people, uh, intellectual people, I dare say, uh, to sort of say, oh, well, that's, that's collecting. Collecting is a rather rubbish thing, uh, attitude or, or, or a habit that perhaps you shouldn't be proud of. But it's not true. I mean, it, it, collecting is indeed a sort of s simple-minded thing that, that children do, and I did, and uh, you collect anything. You collect bus tickets in my day when there were buses. But, but, <laughs> but also, when you actually then start collecting butterflies, or flowers, or fossils, and you start to put them together, and you very soon discover that actually this one is the same as that one, so that's rather better specimen, and so I'll throw that away. <laughs> and then this one is like that one, but hang on, it's different. Now why is it different? So you start as to become a taxonomist. You start the very basis of zoology, which is taxonomy. And you start to think, yeah, maybe they were related to one another. And before you know where you are, you suddenly find that Darwin has got something very exciting to tell you. How it is that these things became related to one another and how these different closely related forms led to actually much, even more bigger disparities. And before you know where you are, you're riveted by evolutionary biology. And uh, one of the great excitements of coming to this university and to this Cedric Road uh, Street, Downing Street, um, is that for the first time uh, you were going to see something of the great range of the natural world. When I was at school, you learnt about cockroach and you learnt about uh, uh, crayfish and dogfish and rabbits, um, and that was it. But here you suddenly saw this fantastic range and variety of the natural world. There was a marvellous um, lecturer here, and to my shame, I can't remember his name. I don't think I ever really remembered it for very long because he was a guest lecturer. It was the only lecture he gave, but he, led, he gave it in this institute, in the Department of Zoology. And it was a lecture about frogs. And it was, he explained that frogs needed in... They hadn't got shells to their eggs, so they had to have liquid of one kind. And all the different devices and ways in which frogs produced liquids, how they got to pools, how they produced froth, how they kept them in their mouths, how they made in cells on their backs, even hatched them in their stomachs. And I was sitting in this lecture room here on Downing Street with my jaw sagging, just thinking about frogs. And, and nobody had done that before. And that was a, a, a revelatory moment which I owe this university and this department. Wonderful. Well, we have some specimens from this museum to, to show you now, David. Just a few that, were, that have been newly set from a selection of about 50 that were donated to the museum. And I think you might recognize them. I'll give you a hint if you don't. Look at what's behind them as well. You might recognize what's behind them, maybe. Who donated those to the museum, David? <laughs> mm. Mm. I caught these. <laughs> and today, it's illegal. It is today. But tell me where you collected these. Well, <laughs> uh, I was in, it was in, must have been late 50s. Uh -huh. And I was in Paraguay. And um, 
I wanted to go up into, the, the, there's a big desert called the Chaco, but also there's some good rainforests. And uh, there's a river called the Jejui, which goes up into the rainforest. And I wanted to get up there, and I, I, I camera, Charles Lagos, the cameraman, and I persuaded a, la a launch to take us up there. And the launch took us for about uh, 50 miles or something, and then said, we're going no further, this river's too shallow. I said, we haven't, we haven't got to the rainforest yet. Anyway, in the end, I found a, a man with an outboard and a canoe who said he was on, had to go up into the, into the headwaters. Great, I said, simple-minded idiot. <laughs> uh, we'll come with you, can you give us a lift? Yeah. So he did, and he took us in the rainforest, and he took us to, and to a clearing where um, he was a newer woodcutter who was cutting timber. And he said, well, I'm now off. I've got to go and do some other work. And it suddenly dawned on me, I've got no way of getting back. <laughs> and I said, how are you going to get? He said, well, I'll pick you up on the way back. I said, fine. So here I am in the clearing in the rainforest, um, but he didn't know how long he was going to be. And I realized that if, I, if he was going to come by and he called me and said, hold up, where are you? And the answer there came none. He would push off and we'd be still up there. So I'd have to stay in the, in the clearing. So we had to film where we were within 100 yards of the river. We would hear a motorboat. And that meant that restricted us very much. So I only had really could work on what was going on in the clearing. One morning I got up and I could, couldn't see from one side of the clearing to the other because there was a solid, dense cloud of flying butterflies. Thrilling. It was a migration. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about butterflies migrating in that time. But it was there, and it was there the next day, and we couldn't leave, so what did I do? Well, I thought, perhaps I should catch a few. <laughs> see? <laughs> And they so are. I, uh, because we were stuck there, I caught rather a lot. <laughs> and, um, and I thought, yes, yeah, so I'm making a survey, of course, of the different species that there are. <laughs> they are so And there beautiful. are a few of them. I think you collected about 50 in these little film tins. I collected them, yes, and I put them, wrapped them up. I'm yeah. afraid I killed them in a primitive way, which is by pinching them. Mm -hmm. And then I wrapped them in paper and I put them in a film tin. This is all the original paper. There's a the paper, and when yeah. I got back, I realized I was at well, was about a decade afterward, that if anyone discovered that, I was a criminal. So, because you could no longer catch. This was you in the 1950s. English butterflies, and quite right, too. Yeah, yeah. But what do I do with these? It, I thought I'd give them here. Wonderful. I think they're very grateful. <laughs> um, this was, of course, part of, of ZooQuest. Yes, Look at this book. Oh. How many of these did you have to write for how many episodes or series of, of, of there was, ZooQuest? There was, there were six of these. Six? Well, well, there were six books, but there were ten expeditions, yes. Amazing. Did you enjoy writing at that stage? I, I don't enjoy writing at any stage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite surprised at that. What? Because I find it really difficult, but you have got such a gift with words. Um, that I thought this was always part and parcel of, of who you were and how you enjoyed to communicate the natural world. Well, I don't find writing easy. Wow, that gives me hope. It really <laughs> does. <laughs> um, I, we, we are, I have so many questions to ask you, but I want to get to the questions uh, from our, uh, the members of the public who wrote in. So we have a question now for you from Brendan Greenstone. He's 11 years old. He cut, he's a member of the Young Zoologist Club um, here at the museum, and Brendan is in our audience. There he is. What's your question, Brendan? Um, well, you must have seen so many animals in your life. Is there a particular animal that you have not seen that you would love to? You've seen so many animals in your life, but is there one animal you haven't seen yet that you would really love to? Um, oh, there are lots, really. Still, are there lots? Oh, Still. yeah, yeah. There's, there's a new species of birds of paradise, they say, in east, northeastern New Guinea, one of the parotias. And I haven't seen it. I'm very, very, <laughs> I'm very keen on birds of paradise. I think they're the most uh, stunning things. On. One of the things which is missing from the ornithological displays of this museum, I don't know. <laughs> Paul Brakefield, pay attention. I, I, I didn't <laughs> notice. Oh, that's not true. There's a, the, the, you, the, there was, in fact, Wallace's standard wing, which is an aberrant bird of paradise, but the main bird of paradise was, 
plumes. Uh, there isn't one. But anyway... Um, but there's a new species. I'm so there's surprised. There's a new species in a perota every... somewhere in the north. I may not be right, but I'd like but to But there's a rumour. Well, you must get out there immediately. They are... <laughs> No time to waste after this conversation, obviously. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm surprised. I thought you had seen every, every one now, every, every bird of paradise. Uh, I, well, I've seen others. Yeah, yes, I, yeah I, you've I, seen a vast I've, I've got selection. the set yeah. except this new one, if it does exist. <gasps> Oof. Oof. Must, we must figure yeah. that out, sort that out <laughs> immediately. Um, and for, um, from the zoology club uh, for 13 to 18-year-olds, we have Harriet Hewitt. She's 15, and she has a question for you about filming with animals. Good afternoon. What species of animal did you feel best interacted with the camera? Mm. What Good species question. of animal interacted? Best interacted with the camera was a real well, show off. <laughs> well, actually, we do all our best to stop animals interacting with the camera. <laughs> because we try to show the animals as though, they are, as though we aren't there. So if they start looking at the camera, it spoils that illusion. Mm. But nonetheless, there are some that do. Um, and actually, gorillas do, and chimpanzees do. Um, and I think it's because, or whatever you do to try and stop them, if they are habituated so they aren't worried about your presence as a human being's presence, and there are gorillas and chimpanzees like that that have been accustomed to human beings, when they see the camera, they see their own reflection in, in the camera uh, filter, which is on the front. So they come along and they look like <laughs> in, into the camera. Now that, that does destroy the illusion I mean, <laughs> that you're eavesdropping on them. But that is nonetheless the answer to your question. That's the one that interacts most with the camera. Yeah. And how difficult has it been to capture natural behaviors in their purest form over your, during your career, is there one animal where you just really wanted to show what they were capable of, left to their own devices, and you just couldn't quite capture that? Well, as a, you're always thinking that you have, you've failed to do it, really? really, one way or another, to fail to do justice, because animal behaviour is so interesting, particularly the higher animals, I uh, mean birds and mammals. Uh, reptiles don't interact all that much. <laughs> um, but um, some do. I mean, Komodo dragon, of which is, you've got the earliest uh, skeleton, I believe, the first to be collected, is in this museum. And very formidable it looks it too. It is, indeed. Um, but they, they certainly interact all right. Um, <laughs> yeah. You've had the pleasure of interacting with one back in the 50s, on Komodo Island, as it yes. was then called. Uh, tell me about your first experience of a Komodo dragon. Um, well, it, 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 this is back in 1955, and there, there was no television film ever taken of, of, of that. We would be the first. Um, and it took us a long time to get there, and one thing or another. And, and people in Java hadn't heard of Komodo dragons in 1955. Um, and, uh, we finally got, got our way to, to the island and, and landed, and uh, there was a small village, I think it's much bigger now, but there was a small village there, and, and the local, uh, we asked them in my primitive Bahasa Indonesia, um, were there dragons there? And they said, yes, yes, yes. And said, well, can you show us where we'll see them? And they said, yes, yes, yes. Uh, and they said, what you need is a dead goat. And I said, have you, have you got one? They said, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and I said, is it, is it nice and smelly? And they said, yes, yes, yes. Uh, and so they took off this dragon, uh, to this uh, goat, and we hung it from a tree. Uh, so I thought I was being clever in that I would hang it where we, we, the smell would, disappear, would uh, extend and, and the dragon would try and reach it but not be able to collect it. And uh, so we built a hide and uh, the boys behind me, or the men behind me, who had carried the gear, were talking. And I was saying, shh, shh. <laughs> and they went on talking. And so I got very cross. I said, you must, must make a noise. Go away. Of course, they knew that bird or dragons, like other reptiles, are stone deaf. <laughs> No, it didn't make a difference whether they made any amount of noise. 
So, but Howard, that was just an ignorant, English, ignorant Englishman. Um, and, but eventually, we did, we did get it. And, but I, I, I was watching through the this little hide of uh, screen of live of leaves that we had towards the goat hanging in the riverbed. And uh, in due course, I turned round and thought it was the boys who had come back. And it wasn't. <laughs> it was a Komodo dragon, which is just, just sort of there. Um, and I thought, well, this is very interesting. Um, and and it's, it's sort of long yellow tongue. You know, savouring the air, no doubt, my, uh, my body perfume. And, and so it sat there, and, uh, and, we, and Charles, who was a cameraman, turned around and, and filmed the camera, filmed the dragon, really, just, just sitting there, as it were. Wow. And a butterfly came and sat on its nose, I remember. It was <laughs> and eventually, and I thought, what do we do now? Um, and eventually, the dragon went, oh, heaved itself up and ran down. And, and got the bait. But it was a magical moment, um, which I've never forgotten. Um, and it was the first film that had ever been taken. Uh, certainly, there was a, uh, an American company in the 20s who went did, uh, did one or two shots in 35 mil, but that was otherwise the first one. And of course, now the dragons are a star, um, and it's certainly the, the skeleton dragon down in the museum. It's a star in its own right, too. What an amazing experience early in your career and, and subsequent experiences that I know we all wish we could have a little taste of with all the incredible programs um, that you filmed. We've got a question from another member of the public um, about that, about the evolution of, of, of programs. Barnaby Fogg is, um, has been a huge fan of yours since he was a boy and he went out birding with his father and he watched the life of birds avidly on VHS tape. Do any of you know what that is, all you young people out there? Um, he's reading medicine now and uh, pursuing a BA in zoology as well. And Barnaby wants to know, Sir David, if you could change one thing about natural history programming and how it has evolved, what would it be? Is there anything you would change in the, in the course of, of this amazing career of yours? I, I have been unbelievably lucky in that I started um, in television in 1954. 52, yeah, 50, 52. Um, and 54, I went off for the first ZooQuest trip. And we used a, a clockwork camera of 60 mil film, which then was the state of the art. Um, and so much so that the rather antiquated film department, though I say it myself, at the BBC, said, we're not going to use this newfangled 60 millimeter film because it's smaller than 35. But anyway, we did that. But since, so I was lucky. That was the first time that the BBC had used 16 mil film for natural history. And then after that, almost every year, there was a new development. Wow. Uh, and so uh, black and white film, because that was where we started. But color came, long lenses came, uh, highly sensitive film came so that you could film at night. Underwater cameras came. Uh, High-speed cameras came, so you could slow down things. Aerial cameras came. Uh, the, one of the latest things, at least, uh, but now it's old hat, but the first drones that came were, were tremendously exciting. So every year there's been things. Now there is actually, I think, almost nothing that we, we can't record. Can really? You think, well, can, you, can you think of something you record? Well, I, I just bow down to the, the, the team effort um, that is involved in, in sort of your imagination and making things happen so that you can film what you need to film over the years. But I probably can't imagine everything that you can imagine, <laughs> you know, knowing the natural world like you do. But to think that you're saying now technology can pretty much match whatever you would like I'm to saying, capture. Yes, almost everything, really. I mean, the, 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 I missed out the, actually the biggest of the developments. The biggest developments was the shift from, from film uh, to electronic. And, and that's not just, it meant that you could actually go on recording, uh, not for just 10 minutes, which is all you could do on a 60 mil film, yeah. um, but you could go on recording for days on end. And not only that, not only could you see what it is that you'd got as soon as you did it, but the, the detachment of, of the optical section which text receives the picture and can record it without any attachment of wires, you can record it next door, meant that you could get a small little miniature camera now 
and you can put it in a bird's nest in a tree, for example, and you can go and sit in your tent and just wait for it to come. And you don't even have to wait to press the button because actually you can just get recording it in a cycle until it actually happens, then you press the button. And so th I, uh, that change and all the other changes means that... that but that now throws us back on our invention because we no longer can have the excuse that we couldn't get that because, you know, there were no conditions or, or it was too difficult or whatever. Now we actually have the technical facilities, the technical possibilities to do almost anything. Oh. So now what we have to think about is how to make a good program, and that's a quite different question. Interesting. I like that. Um, another question for you now, David, from uh, one of the museum's volunteers. Her name is Rachel Hooper. Rachel, where are you? There you are. What's your question? Uh, Sir so David, my question is, if you could borrow any evolutionary adaptation from any of the wonderful animals that you've seen, which one would you choose to try out? <laughs> which? What, what evolutionary adaptation from all the animals that you've seen around the world would you like to try out? Hmm, that's a good question. I wouldn't mind to be able to fly. <laughs> um, but also, I'd like to be able to hear. <laughs> Um, because we don't hear a huge amount of the, amount of the vocalization which goes on not only under the sea but around us all the time. Um, I mean, uh, the high uh, pitch of bats we can actually bring down to ourselves, but there are lots of other things of insect calls and so on, which we, and frog calls, which we don't hear. So, Hearing, I suppose, and is, is one of the things I'd really like to do, apart from being able to fly. And, of course, we actually can fly, you know, particularly with drones and so on. But that facility, and to see in the dark, would be wonderful. Because that, after all, is, is, is where so much of mammalian activity goes on after dark. So we only see, and we only show you, uh, as, as filmmakers, we tend to, f to show what's on during the daytime. But what's on at night, well, now we, can, we have got various devices that we can do in this uh, high, high, high sensitivity cameras and so on. So we, we are getting, on, getting there. But we can only do it through the camera. One of the most alarming things, of course, is, is that all the cameras can see uh, in the dark, but you can't. Uh, and one day a producer said to me, he said, I think we, we should really get uh, a film of, of lions roaring. And I said, well, they don't roar much during the day. They roar at night. He said, no, exactly. They were roaring at night. <laughs> so what we thought would be, we could find, we found a as a dominant lion just on the, there on the plains who roars every night. And so we suggested you go out in the Land Rover uh, and go to where he's roaring, and then we will come up on the other side and, uh, and uh, film you. And you can lean out of the Land Rover uh, <laughs> and, and say something interesting. Um, but we will use a Land Rover that doesn't have a door on the front, really, because people would wish to see you know, who it was, just to have a little leaning over a window wouldn't be right. Of course not, I realise all those things. So we set off on a Land Rover with no doors and look at this roaring lion. But of course you can't see it. So he's on the, the producer and is, 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 is uh, talking to the cameraman and the cameraman is saying, yes, it's very good. Get, get him to drive a bit closer, see. So I said, and this guy, ooh, you know what, it, you know what a lion's all about. But if, if when it's roaring just there, it's a very, very loud noise. <laughs> and when the director says, uh, he says, we've got to get closer because you can't get a good shot in them. And I must say, as being as close as I am to the front row, yes, the front row of the lion, that's going, ooh, and they said, it's perfectly all right if you're a Land Rover. Don't get out. I said, there is no <laughs> difficulty about that. Anyway, I'd quite like to see it in the dark. <laughs>
in hindsight. The things we are asked to do as presenters sometimes. I know, well, you know, you're, you suffer too. You step back and you wonder, what on earth made me think that was a good idea? Um, now, Jude Morris is 11 years old uh, from the Young Zoologist Club and has a question for you about another extraordinary capability in the animal kingdom. Jude, what's your question? Um, so, um, lizards lose their tail at will. What body part would you not mind losing? <laughs> you know that lizards lose their tail, like tails at will. What body part would you not mind losing? It's a very personal question. <laughs> well, I suppose, there is, I mean, to take you seriously and give you a proper answer, there's only one thing I can think of. I mean, I, I wouldn't like to lose my little toe because I somehow suspect that, that that's helpful to keep your balance. Mm. Well, also, but the thing I know that I can do without, and which we can all do without, is that evolutionary relic, uh, the appendix. So, uh, and I remember a great story of that extraordinary lady, uh, uh, Diane Fossey, who did, without whom the mountain gorillas would almost certainly be extinct, certainly in, 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 in some parts of Africa. Uh, she was um, passionate to go to, to look at uh, apes. And uh, Louis Leakey, the great primatologist of Africa, you would go on a fundraising tour in North America, and she was passionate about uh, apes and went to him afterwards and said, uh, I want to go on and study apes. And he said, have you got your appendix? And she said, yes. And he said, well, then you can't possibly go. I mean, because, you know, you can't go to the middle of Africa. What happened if you get appendicitis? So forget it. See, and disappeared. <laughs> Five years later, he turns up for a second tour of North America. And who's in the front row but Diane Fossey? And Diane Fossey goes up to him after his lecture and says, wonderful lecture, Dr. Leakey, thank you so much. I've had my appendix out. When do I leave? <laughs> That's a wonderful story. That's dedication for you. Wonderful. Thank you for your question. Um, we have another specimen to show you, if that's all right, uh, David. This time, two white-necked rock fowls, or Picathartes gymnocephalus. Yeah. Oh, Sound yeah, familiar that. to you? Yes, that is. <laughs> now, these ones were collected from Ghana, and they were donated to the museum in the 1960s. Thank you very much, Shelley. Take a look at these beautiful specimens, in fact. Yes. Um, but you're familiar with them for another reason. Um, these birds, or this species, was quite important, um, or played a very important role in the, in the naming of the groundbreaking theory ZooQuest. Is yes. that right? Yes, so tell me the story, or tell us the story. Well, I had the idea in 1954 that uh, th th there had been natural history programs which people from the zoo, because all television was live in the, in the, when I joined in 52. And so you had live programs in which uh, a man from the zoo would bring up animals uh, in a sack and then up to the Alexander Palace and, and put out these poor things onto a, onto a, a bench with a, with a table mat on it. And, and explain what they are. And it was great because, of course, they were live and with any luck they would bite him or, or <laughs> pee, they would. pee down his front or escape. Or, that was good television. <laughs> um, and then some wonderful people called Armand Mikhaila Dennis turned up. And uh, they showed, for the first time, they'd been making films in Kenya for years, and they called it uh, On Safari, I think, and they showed some of the films they called, and that was terrific. I thought, why don't we get the two things together? So I put up an idea that we should go to Africa uh, with a, a collecting expedition from the London Zoo um, to collect rare animals, and mammals and birds, uh, for showing in the zoo. And there's a very nice man who was in charge of, of the reptile house. Uh, and I said, uh, when we agreed on this plan, I said, well, it's a good plan, but what we need is a, is a quest for something, you see, some, some really exciting creature that nobody's ever seen before on television, or indeed in, in captivity. Is there such a thing in the Sierra Leone, which is where I plan to go? And he said, oh, oh yes, 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 there is. There's a, there's a very interesting bird. And I said, so, so it's zoo quest for... What, what's it called? And he said, well, it's called Picasati's gymnocephalus. I said, <laughs> yes, yes, but um, ZooQuest for Picasati's gymnocephalus 
is a bit of a mouthful, not actually an audience grabber, you see. Doesn't it have a common name? Oh, yes, yes, he said, it does. I said, that's great, what's, what's the common name? And he said, well, it, you could call it the bald-headed rock crow. And I said, well, <laughs> e even the bald-headed rock crow isn't that actually a crowd puller. So we actually didn't call it, just called it Zoo Quest. Uh, but anyway, this is what we were after. This is the bald-headed rock crow, Picathartes gymnocephalus, and it has never been filmed, and it has never been seen in any zoo alive, and uh, the zoo man, we filmed it, and the zoo man collected it, and it, one of these lived in the London Zoo for quite a number of years, what was the first captive example. So at least I've recognised that, and I'm not an ornithologist. <laughs> well done, well done. You've spent your entire life travelling the length and breadth of this planet, discovering uh, all sorts of species, ever since you were very young in Leicester, discovering new species. But Kane Colston, uh, who's a science teacher from Hull, and another member of the public who wrote in with a question, asks, if you had a, tra a travel, a time travel machine, which epoch would you want to visit? Uh, who would you take with you? Me, please. Um, <laughs> and what would you look for? Well, first of all, you got a ticket. Okay. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I can die happy. <laughs> but that apart, what should we go, what should we go for? Go for? Um, I suppose in, 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 in a theoretical sense, the really exciting thing would be go back to the Precambrian, to, or to at least the Ediacara, when in fact you were beginning to get metazoans, uh, animals that are rather like sea pens uh, on the bottom of the sea. But I mean, that's a theoretical pleasure, isn't it? I, I mean, to be for the real bazaars for the real adrenaline release, you would have to go back to the Jurassic, wouldn't you? But I wouldn't go back to the Jurassic so much for dinosaurs. I mean, that'd be, that'd be great. Well, nothing wrong with dinosaurs. But the thing I'd really like to go back for is uh, uh, Quetzalcoatlus, uh, Northrop Eye, which you will probably know is a kind of pterosaur, a flying reptile who was a contemporary with dinosaurs. And Quetzalcoatlus Northrop Eye was discovered in Texas. The name is based from a, a, a Maya, um, an Aztec goddess, god, a flying serpent. Um, and the amazing thing was it was a, just a basal a bone, a small bone from the wing. And it was undoubtedly the, 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 the bone of a pterosaur except that it was about 10 times bigger than the equivalent that they knew about. And if you multiplied it up, I don't know what the factor was, maybe it was five times, but it was very, very much bigger. And uh, it, if you did that calculation, it had wings which were 30 feet across, I mean, the size of a small aeroplane. And um, subsequent excavations produced the whole wings so they certainly existed 30 feet across. Now, when you think about it, how do you beat, how do you get into the air if you have wings 30 feet across? Because the first, the first beat of the wing, you would beat on the ground. Um, and th so the, one, of the, one of the solutions uh, suggested was that these things only lived on cliffs um, and, and launched themselves into the air. But it's pretty tricky, isn't it? I mean, you've got to get back to a cliff Quite every time. Quite respective, you know, don't you uh, think? <laughs> there is a theory now that there was it, the musculature of the of the limbs are such that it seems that it's just possible that this thing would give an explosive leap into the air and then bat it. But I would I would dearly like to see Quetzalcoatlus Northrop Eye Spring and see how it got into the air. That would be quite something, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. Indeed. You began your career as a natural history presenter, you could say in its purest form, showcasing a range of animals and, and their behaviours, but gradually over your career there was a, a sort of evolution in, in the stance that you took with respect to conservation, environmental issues. Was there a moment that you remember when you, when you realised this was inevitable because of the things you were seeing as you were filming around the world? Um. Yes, um, but th the fact is that you and I both, well, no, well, actually, I know, well, know what you're going to do next, so it doesn't too, but I know in the past, uh, I certainly, at any rate, 
have been sent by the BBC to film animals where they are, to film pristine rainforests, to see the complexity of the natural world at its richest. So you go where they are, not where they're not. So in a way, I got a, a rosier view of the, the situation in the natural world from many another naturalist. Uh, but at the same time, we became slowly aware. From about 1960 onwards, I think, 1970. Yes, and we did say, actually, if you, if you went back and found, the, particularly the last program in, in quite a lot of series, almost every one of them ended by saying, look, this is uh, enormously complex. Uh, it's, um, uh, mankind is the most powerful species that has yet emerged on Earth. We are destroying the natural world. Its future lies in our hands. A very uh, straightforward message, which, but it didn't cause much of effect uh, to start with. Maybe we didn't say it loud enough. But you have to be very careful about what you say. You better be right, um, because nobody else is is talking about this. Uh, and so you ha have an obligation to make absolutely sure that your facts are correct. So we, it wasn't until about the, the mid-60s, I think, that we started to say, look, we know now that you really are. Now, mid-60s, well, to me, it sounds quite reasonable, but that's 50 years ago. And we have been saying for a long time, why did it make a big impression with Blue Planet 2 about plastics? I don't know. It, uh, it, just the, 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 the mood which makes people react to television programs is mysterious. Indeed. But, but um, I'm, glad, I, I'm just relieved that it did. I suppose part of it is that uh, with plastics, there's something you can do if you're a viewer. If you hear that the elephants are being shot in, in, Af in Africa, there's not much you can do as a viewer except to say, how terrible. Um, and you can subscribe, but you can't do anything practical. Certainly more difficult. But, but, yeah. but when you say plastic bags are strangling albatross and seals and turtles and whales, and here's some pictures, then that they see there is a bag that they may have taken out of their food store only the day before. So they do know that there's something you can do. Um, and maybe that is why uh, there was such a response. Mm. And, but that there is such a response is, is very heartening and important. I mean, heartening in one way, but very important. We must act on these things. And the public at large know that. And the public at large want politicians to do something about it, and industrialists, and plenty of other places, and to do it themselves. Indeed. That's why I think it caught on. On that very subject, we have a question from Gabrielle McBeath. She's um, 18 from the Museum Zoology Club. Uh, she has a question about the environmental challenges. He, I'm so sorry, Gabrielle. It didn't have an, another L and an E, so I should have known. Um, but what is your question? Mr. David, my uh, question is, if you could assemble the world's leaders, what, in your view, is the most pressing environmental issue threatening our existence that you would want them to address? What is, if you could uh, approach the, world's, the world leaders, what is the most pres pressing environmental issue that we are facing that needs to be tackled? Um, allow me to. I think he might. But there, are, but there are two paramount, universal, problems facing the planet. Uh, one is the one I've just described, which is bigger than just plastic. We are polluting the seas uh, to a dreadful degree. Um, but also, uh, we are polluting the atmosphere, um, and as a consequence of which, um, global temperatures, the earth is warming, and the universal disasters that come from the warming of the, of the seas and the planet will be widespread and felt everywhere. There will not entirely be disasters. I mean, this country will change, it's, it's get warmer, and we may think that's rather nice, and that there's, in fact, species from, from Europe will be migrating up to us. But overall, we are making life harder for the rest of this, uh, for the life on the planet 
both ways. And the, the point is that both of those, the solutions are clear. Both of them can be cured if humanity gets together. Um, to, if you, the technology of, of getting power without polluting the atmosphere is absolutely clear. Uh, you can get them from the wind and the sun directly and the seas. Uh, and if you, you have two difficulties now, first of all, you have to have a way in which you can, trans, you can transfer power electronically, uh, electrically, uh, uh, over great distances without too much loss. And we know how to do it. We haven't done it yet, but we know how to do it. Secondly, you've got to be able to store it. We know how to do that, too, but, but we haven't really yet done it. But solve those two problems, technically, and the world could have pollution-free power at a, an extraordinarily cheap price all over the world. Africa has got, has, has got all the power in the world, and we could be using it. So that is the great challenge which we can meet. And if you're going to do that and you can clean up the seas, we can make the, this planet a planet for all species, for ourselves and everything else for which we have responsibility. And I believe it can be done. And I believe what is more, that there has been a, a sea change in the world opinion, that all around the world now, people, particularly if I may say so, young people whose future lies ahead of them, farther than the rest of us. And if they can get together and solve these, there's no reason why we shouldn't live on the planet and care for the creatures that live on it just as we care for ourselves. And I just hope that it'll happen. I believe there's a possibility that it will, and I pray that it does. We have it in us. We certainly do. What a wonderful, inspirational answer. I'm seeing a lot of people getting um, quite emotional at that answer. <laughs> Very good question. Thank you for that wonderful question, Gabrielle, and forgive me for calling you a female. I do apologize. Um, we also have another great question on that, on that topic, um, if I may. It's from Taras Baines, who's also 18. Uh, Taras, what's your question? Um, how do you think a balance can be struck between the need for economic development and environmental conservation and protection? So the balance that needs to be struck between economic development and environmental conservation and protection. Can that be achieved, David? Well, um, there's, a, there's a, a sort of a, a cheap joke, isn't there, that goes around, which is uh, uh, infinite expansion. Anyone who thinks that you can expand infinitely in a finite environment has to be either mad or an economist. <laughs> I personally think that is just it in a nutshell. No, really that's all very well for a cheap laugh. But um, somehow we've got to make that problem. Um, one of the problems that certainly faces Homo sapiens uh, is, is population size. And demographers will explain that actually the reason, one of the reasons why our increase in population has been going as fast as it has is that a lot of us are living much longer, like me. And the fact that you, quite a lot of people live in their 80s and 90s now means that the population is increasing. Uh, it is also, so to some degree, the increase is going to level off. Uh, it is also the case that wherever you look in the world, if women are given political f freedom to do what they wish to do and the medical facilities that they wish to have or are necessary, that they will actually take advantage of that and limit the size so birth rate will fall. So there's reason to suppose, I mean, I'm very worried as what's going to happen of the increase before that happens, and that's another question. But in the very long run, the population problem may diminish. By which time, um, we may have reduced the price of power for the reasons I've just described. 
so that everybody can have the power that's needed. What we then know, so living is going to become easier for humanity. And what we then have to do is the wisdom of working out how we may live in harmony with the natural world, allowing the natural world to have a part of it that it's always had, and perhaps allowing the natural world to expand beyond nature reserves and to live alongside humanity, which it is possible to do over a great area. The May will always be, should always be a place reserved entirely for the natural world, but there's still a lot we could do to live in harmony with it and ourselves. And so it is possible that the doom that a lot of people foresee coming across us may not happen. But it's in the hands of young people and the hands of the unborn. But it is just the possibility that it might happen. And I believe it might. Thank you, David. Um, I'm, I'm aware that we're running out of time, but I do want to get through the final three questions from our volunteers and uh, our Zoo Club members. So on the subject of the challenge we face about protecting our natural places and perhaps recovering some of our lost wild places. Uh, Jared, Jared Howell is 10 years old, and he wrote in with a question uh, about his favorite animals, Eurasian wolves. And he asks, would you want wolves to be reintroduced back into the highlands of Scotland? Um, well, it depends how many people there are living there. I, I, I don't know enough about wolves to, to make positive uh, uh, statements. But my impression is that wolves and people don't mix all that easily. And that, that you do need a lot of space. And space is something we're running out of. Uh, it could be that in northern Scotland, where areas in which there's a very low population, uh, that there are places where, in fact, wolves, which require a lot of space, where you could, there could be a wolf pack. Um, I, I, I welcome some reintroductions of creatures that were already uh, native to this country. Uh, it seems to me that beavers can be doing a, a good job to, to restrain oh, flooding, for example, by making dams and one for the, And they have been established, and they have been uh, so far so successful. The trouble is that, of course, eventually, once you start doing that, you are introducing, introducing a kind of element of control and the moment may very well come when, in fact, there are rather too many beavers, and then you're going to have to start shooting beavers. Now, by and large, I think we have quite a lot of problems about handling our wildlife without adding to them. So if, you're a, uh, if you have a few hundred square miles of Scotland in which there's nobody else is living, introduce wolves by all means. Um, but you must be careful where you do it because I don't think they do live alongside humanity as well as all that. Indeed. On a similar uh, topic, we have Jeff Oliver, who is, uh, there you are, who is a museum volunteer. Um, Jeff, what's your question? If it becomes possible in the future to use genetic engineering techniques to bring back an extinct species, do you think it should be done? Genetic engineering to bring back extinct species, do you think that is a viable solution? It may be viable, um, but I would have great misgivings about doing it. So you produce, you are going to get the ovum uh, of a living species that's related to the extinct one, and you're going to breed different uh, females and different males, uh, uh, which you're going to bring together and select the genes that you think the extinct species had. And after an awful lot of experiments and an awful lot of trouble, you bring a zygote and you bring a, 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 a fertile embryo of this new species, which is living uh, in an alien world with n not another one of its kind uh, to mate with that cannot possibly reproduce itself. I suppose you might conceive of it and do it twice but then they're going to be so genetically close that they are, may not be viable anyway. And you are bringing this new thing into existence for whose benefit? For the person who's playing God, I suggest. 
Um, and I shrink from that notion that you can play with life in that way entirely to satisfy your own theoretical uh, in, in imagination. I would think that the amount of research and time spent doing that could be spent better elsewhere. Recovering the lost habitats of these mm. species for for one thing. Before we come to that lovely young lady over there, we're just about to wrap up. I, I, I know you've touched on it a little bit, David, but you know this room is filled with young people who have grown up watching your programs and as a result have become wildlife lovers, wildlife enthusiasts. Some of them are studying conservation, zoology, biology. Um, what advice would you have for them as they enter adulthood in what is a, a rather precarious period of humanity? I, I don't know um, what advice I'd give. Um, I'm not sure I'm in a position to give advice. Um, young people uh, see the world in a different way. Um, and uh, you will be aware of what the demands are. Um, but the demands, of course, are to ourselves, to our own species. That's perfectly true. Um, but we are not the only species that lives uh, on this planet. Um, it is the case that we have the power and the, uh, to exterminate anything and to protect anything. Um, but how do you use that? Um, we, should be, we should care for the planet. We should care for all the things that live in it. But we also depend upon the planet. We depend on the planet for every mouthful of food we eat and for every breath of air that we take. And if we damage the rest of the planet, of the life of the rest of the planet, in the end we damage ourselves. So we have a grave responsibility. We now have the power to wreck the whole thing. We just have to make sure that we care for it and that we don't wreck it. Indeed, and this question I think is a lovely one to end on, um, considering your glittering career and all that you have achieved um, for us and as individuals and for the planet. It's a question from another young zoologist club member who's over there. Uh, her name is Elfie, she's seven years old. Elfie, what's your question? If you could travel back in time to when you were seven, like me, what one thing would you tell yourself? David, if you could travel back in time to when you were seven years old, like Elfie over there is, what uh, one thing would you tell yourself? <laughs> In a sort of motto, you mean, do you? Yeah. I think you should say, uh, treat other people as you would wish to treat yourselves, do as you would be done by, and treat animals in the same sort of way. Wonderful way to end a really lovely conversation. Thank you so much for your time and your insights into your career and, and your life. Ladies and gentlemen, the voice of the natural world, Sir David Attenborough. <laughs>